today. Get up this morning, Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your grace. Lord, we thank you so much for Christ, the cross, and salvation. Lord, I thank you that you looked upon me and loved me enough to pay for my sin debt. Lord, I thank you for loving me enough to bless me beyond what I deserve. Lord, more than salvation. Lord, that's the best thing in the world, but you bless me more than that. Lord, I'm thankful. Lord, I pray that you help us here this morning. Lord, I pray that you help our hearts and our minds to be open and receptive to your word. Help us to apply it to our lives. Lord, I pray if somebody's hurting here, whether physically, mentally, or spiritually, Lord, I pray that you give them peace where peace is needed, comfort where comfort is needed, Lord, healing where healing is needed. Lord, I beg you, please help us hear this all this morning as we get ready to sing for you this morning. Lord, I pray that somebody that's backslid gets right with you this morning. Lord, I pray that somebody that's not saved, I pray that you prick their hearts and show them their need of a Savior. Lord, I pray that you help us all this morning to be in unity. Lord, help us to follow after you and seek your will. Lord, I pray that you help us to love your word and apply it to our lives. Lord, I beg you, please help those that couldn't be here this morning, whether sickness or some other issue. Lord, I pray that if, if at all possible that they be listening on the internet this, this morning, Lord, I beg you. Help us here this morning. I pray that you help Brother Sean to preach with power and unction. Lord, use him in a mighty way. Lord, I beg you, please help us all this morning to grow closer to you. Lord, we can do nothing without you, and we need you as a part of this service, Lord, because if you're not here, then there's no point in even meeting. I beg you, be here among us, Lord. We love you. We thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go and have the choir come up this morning. On a hill called Calvary, Jesus my Lord suffered for me, carried the cross all the way, my sins to atone, then they nailed him to a cross, great was the Suffered it all because he loved me. Because he loved me, my Savior died on a cross, was crucified. No greater love by mortal man has ever been known. It all, he it all because he loved me. Then they carried him away, placed him in a lonely grave. Surely they thought that this would be the end of this man. But on that third and glorious day, God came and rolled the stone away. He rose from the dead because he loved me. Because he loved me, my Savior died. On the cross was crucified. No greater love by mortal man has ever been known. Oh, praise his dear name, he loved me so. Now I am his, he's mine, I know. 
suffered it all because he loved me. Oh, praise his dear name, he loved me so. Now I am his, he's mine, I know. He suffered it all because he loved me. song says there's never a time that he's not been faithful and i'm glad that's true amen 
I'm not as old as some of you, and I'm older than the rest of you, but I'm glad there's never been a time in my life, Brother Beckham, that I can look back and think God failed me right there. Because there's not a single moment, there's not a single time, there's not a single place in my memory where I can look back and think God let me down in that situation. But you know what I can do? I can look back and think about all the times I've let him down, Brother Tony. About all the times that he's impressed my heart to do something or led me to do something or I didn't follow his word or I committed a sin. And yet he's been faithful to me. I'm thankful for that this morning. I'm glad he's been faithful to us. Maybe somebody this morning with a word on your heart, something you want to say or do before the Sean comes and preaches to us today. He's been good to us today. Amen. Somebody else this morning want to give the Lord praise. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Somebody else. Amen. That song of the choir, I think we've sung it, talks about I could have had a really different story. Today could be completely different for you and your family. What do you mean, Brother Zach? I mean the blessings of God could not be evident and present in your life. But yet he's seen fit to bless us and to take care of us. And he's worthy to be praised. Somebody else this morning want to give him praise. Amen. Amen. Somebody else this morning? Amen. Somebody else this morning. Amen. 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 Yes, he is. Some of you may not know this. Sister Carla took a fall during the uh, hay ride last Sunday. And, uh, I mean, she just, she hit her face on the backside of Brother Chris's truck. And it could have been a lot worse. We're so glad the Lord was watching over her during that. Somebody else want to give the Lord praise this morning?
Amen. Somebody else this morning will give him praise. All hearts free. All right. Let's show. All right. Good morning. It's good to be in church. Amen. Amen. Appreciate the, the Lord taking care of Brother Kyle. Amen. Allowing him uh, to come back and be in church. i to be honest with you, as he was uh, making his way up here, I thought... If he can make his way into the choir and sing, I ain't got much of an excuse for anything. Uh, so I appreciate that, amen. Amen, the Lord has been good. I appreciate him answering prayer and taking care of uh, that young man, amen. I appreciate it. I'm glad he still answers prayer, by the way. Uh, really, uh, a study I've been doing on my own, and maybe it'll manifest itself here, but uh, looking at prayer and uh, the effects of prayer and the... Uh, the command to pray. Uh, not only did he tell us to pray, but he said he'd answer our prayers. And so he, he, he said, come to me with your request, and then he said, I'll answer those requests. And, I, I, you know, it may not be exactly how we bring or how, how we expect them to, uh, to be answered, but uh, I'm going to be honest with you, I found him to be faithful. Amen, and uh, he has showed up every time I've ever needed him, and so uh, we've got a faithful God, amen. amen, amen, he's been far better to us than we deserve, uh, I, I, I say that a lot, but uh, I mean it, <laughs> oh, we should have all been in hell, he should have cast us in there the moment we were born, the moment we were failures, sinners in his sight, the moment we became guilty, he should have said, you deserve it. And he didn't do that. He was long-suffering, Brother Beckham, uh, toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so we have a good Savior, amen, a good God amen. that we serve, amen. Uh, let me do this real quick. Uh, do we have anybody in here that is a veteran, a military veteran, either enlisted or has been? How about family members of an enlisted individual or a Brother Norman? We've got, we've got several. May I say this, uh, find time to thank them for their service, amen? Amen, I'll say this. And I know that, uh, and this is not a, a political knock, although it certainly could be our military is not what it once was. I appreciate those individuals that are willing to sacrifice for our country, amen? I know America is a train wreck, but it's far better than a lot of other countries. Right. Amen. The fact that you had you had zero concern this morning when you woke up whether or not you were going to get shot on your way to church, that ought to say something to you. Amen. So God's been better to us than we deserve in more than one facet. Uh, and so I appreciate the Lord, appreciate those veterans. So you ought to find time to thank them uh, for their service. Amen. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 26 this morning. Matthew chapter number 26. We'll look at a study, probably be in John chapter 12 as well, somewhat throughout the message. Uh, look at a, a couple correlating passages, things that I picked up in my in my daily Bible reading. By the way, y'all read your Bible every day. There's your there's your commercial uh, for reading your Bible. You say you're always talking about reading your Bible. Uh, that's because it's a, a necessary uh, it's a necessary thing in a Christian's life. It's to have the input of God in your life. You say, I want to know what God's will is for my life. Well, most of his will is found in these 66 books in your Bible. Uh, most of what God has to say, he has said to you in Scripture. Uh, you say, well, I want to know, you know who I'm supposed to marry. Well, what I found is this. When you take care of the things that you're supposed to take care of, God reveals those other things to you in his time. Uh, I'll say it this way. Uh, Brother Lee Davis always said it like this. He said, the will of God is not something you find it's something you live in. It's not like you're looking for some puzzle piece or some treasure that's been hidden from you. May I remind you, it's does God no good to hide his will from you? No, he wants you to live in his will as much as you want to live in his will. Amen? And so it is something that he reveals to you as you continue in his will. Uh, and may I say this, part of his will is you reading his word. Amen? Amen. I said it often and I'll say it again. Uh, this book is something that he has esteemed higher than his name. Right. Now, Brother Beckham, we've been learning in Sunday school, his name's pretty important. 
The name of God is pretty important. As a matter of fact, there's none under name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. And so that's a pretty significant name and he has established that uh, his word, he is lifted higher than that. And so that is some significance put on his word. Matthew chapter number 26 this morning. We'll begin reading. That's making noise. Y'all probably didn't hear it, but I'm easily distracted. Uh... Like a squirrel. Uh, Don't take much for me. Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 6. Let's read down through verse number 13. We'll pick up John 12 throughout the message. Uh, Matthew 6, or 26 and verse number 6. He said, Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. Now as you get into Matthew chapter number 26, what you're finding is that you're within the final week of the Lord Jesus Christ's life. You are looking at what has been uh, named or detailed as the Passion Week. This week is uh, the time in which the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be crucified. He is going to be arrested. Uh, They are going to crucify the Son of God uh, for the sins of mankind. And what you are seeing is you are seeing within that week. Now John chapter 12, uh, I I believe it's verse number 1, tells us that he was six days until the Passover... And may I remind you that the Lord was crucified on the Passover. And so what that says is this, uh, that Jesus Christ was not only declared by John the Baptist to be, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, uh, but he died as the Lamb of God on the Passover uh, for the sins of mankind so that man uh, might be eternally birthed into the family of God and have your sins washed away. Uh, By the way, that's something you ought to thank God for, amen. Uh, It's something you ought to run a regular basis, thank God uh, that you're not lost and undone and headed to hell. It's something that you ought to have a consistent and a regular praise on your lips giving reason uh, as to why you are happy. By the way the children of God ought to be happy individuals. You ought to be an individual uh, that bears out joy in your life uh, because you say why? Why? What is there to be joyful about? I don't know. Your name's written in heaven. Uh, Your sins have been washed away. Uh, You're not headed to hell. God showed up every time you've ever needed him. Uh, He's in the midst of helping you in the midst of your troubles and your trials and your tribulations. Uh, What you'll find is that God has been far better to you uh, than you deserve and uh, because of that uh, you ought to have a praise on your lips giving thanks to his name. Uh, It's interesting that the book of Hebrews calls that a sacrifice. A sacrifice is the giving of self or the offering. It is an offering of praise. You say who are you giving this offering of praise to. Uh, You're giving it to God. Uh, Why is that? Because he's worthy of your praise. He's worthy of you saying, thank you God for what you've done in my life. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for intervening in my life uh, when I was on my way to hell. Uh, May I remind you, he didn't have to do it. He didn't have to show up in your life, intervene in that situation that was helpless, uh, but he did it anyways. Because he's a good God. We are six days from the Passover according to John. Uh, As you get to Matthew chapter 26, I believe that as Matthew deals with uh, this account, I believe this account in Matthew 26 and in John 12, I believe they are the same account. I believe Matthew is merely uh, looking back on the account. Uh, As you'll find in verse 2, he says that it was two days. Uh, But as you look at verse 6, he said, Now when Jesus was in Bethany, and so there is a a certain looking back at the account. Uh, And so what I want to deal with this morning is I want to look at this message, uh, Missing the Purpose. Missing the purpose. Let's look, number one, at the picture that is presented here 
in our text, the picture uh, that is presented. Uh, when you look at these things, and I've already given you somewhat of the setting uh, to the account, how that we are uh, somewhat uh, six days, that final week uh, before the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, and how that you'll see uh, that in this setting they are in Bethany. Now, Bethany uh, was a town located just outside of Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, he's about two miles away uh, from the city of Jerusalem. Bethany is located on the east side of the Mount of Olives. Now, if you know anything about prophecy, uh, you understand this, that the Mount, uh, the Mount of Olives has a significant prophecy concerning it and the days to come when the Lord comes back, that's where he's coming and he's going to step foot on that place. Uh, that Jer uh, Jerusalem's going to split wide open. He's going to walk into that city as the king because that's who he rightfully is on that day. Uh, but it, Bethany is located on that east slopes of the Mount of Olives and they are in Listen, this is a place uh, that Jesus has spent a lot of time. As a matter of fact, you'll find that there are three individuals located in Bethany uh, that are significant. They are mentioned in John's account uh, of this event. And uh, those three individuals are Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And so you see how that those individuals are going to have a key part uh, in this event. Uh, account that we are looking at. So we saw the picture. We see the place. Uh, the place is Bethany. Now may I say this. Uh, Bethany is known as the house of affliction. The house of affliction. And may I say this. That's, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time here. But affliction is part of life. Right. Suffering is a part of life. You say, but I don't like that. I've yet to meet the individual that did. You're a sick individual if you enjoy suffering. You know, Brother Ed Ballou would say it like this, you are crippled too high for crutches. Amen. Yes, amen. That is a broken place to be in. But what you'll see is this, I found that the Lord can do a great work even in a house of affliction. Amen. It is the scene of this place. You'll remember that this is where Lazarus was according to John chapter 11 and how that Jesus had raised him from the dead. And we'll talk somewhat about that here in a moment. Uh, but we see the place. Let's look at the people. When you look at this account, Matthew says this, now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, to be honest with you, we're not given a whole lot concerning Simon the leper. Uh, what we do see is this, uh, uh, that he at one point was a leper. Now I'll say this, he is not presently at this text a leper because a leper would, uh, would be required to be separated from all the people. And so what we find is this, uh, that the testimony of this Simon is this, that he had once been a leper. And may I remind you uh, that in the Bible times, uh, leprosy was a death sentence in those days. Uh, you'll find that leprosy is a type of sin and how that it eats and it corrupts and it corrodes the body, how that it causes a numbness or a, uh, uh, an inability to feel. And that ends up being the, uh, the death knell in those individuals' lives as they would begin to lose uh, digits and limbs and uh, arms and things of those nature, uh, of that nature. And you'll see that the reason for that is because of corruption that would enter in. Uh, when you look at a leper, oftentimes uh, in those days, uh, they would lose uh, feeling in their extremities. And because of that, when they would cut themselves, they wouldn't know it. An infection would set up in those things. And what you'll see is that that is the reason why they would begin to lose those, uh, those digits and those limbs. And it would uh, eventually get to the point uh, to where it would entirely corrupt their body. By the way, sin will do the same thing to you. Amen. Amen. A little leaven leaveneth the whole what? The whole lump. In its entirety, you say, well, it's just a little sin. May I remind you that a little sin will grow. It is like the, uh, the yeast of those days, the leaven, and how that it would consistently grow. And as that leaven would work, it would encompass the entirety of that bread. And so what you'll see is this. A sin works in the same fashion that it, it ingrains itself in and then it overtakes everything around it. By the way, that's why you ought to cut sin out of your life, Christian. Amen. Amen. You say, well, it ain't hurting nothing. It's hurting far more than you know. When you see Simon, we find that he is a 
leper or he was a leper. It is likely that this individual was one that had already been healed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is intriguing to me that as this individual had been a leper and had been healed, uh, that what you see is this. No doubt he had welcomed Jesus Christ into his home with, well, with open arms. You say, why is that? Let me ask you. If the Lord had only intervened in your life and wrought such a great miracle that no doctor could get done, that no man had an answer for, but he himself healed you of a disease that uh, would, have, uh, would have brought on certain death, I think you'd appreciated him. Amen. I think you would have appreciated him for what he had done for you. Not only do we see Simon the leper, uh, but in John's account what we find is this, uh, that there's Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And what you'll find is this, uh, that when Jesus was anywhere near Bethany, you'll find that they were always uh, around him. It is an uh, an attribute of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha uh, that when the Lord was near them, uh, they were always around him. And so as we find that they were uh, near the Lord, you'll find that they are getting closer to the Lord. As a matter of fact, John states this, uh, that that Lazarus sat at the table eating with those individuals. You say, what is the significance of Lazarus being there? Uh, well, this is in John chapter number 12, but in John chapter number 11, he was dead. Right. Now, I ain't never had lunch with a dead man. Amen, amen. but I'd say that had some, uh, uh, some interesting table talk, amen. Uh, you say, there's Lazarus sitting there. Uh, he had just been dead uh, not too long ago, and they're sitting there having food with him, and then you look across the table and you say, and there's a leper. Uh, he should have been dead, and yet Jesus intervened in his life. Uh, so one was rescued uh, uh, from dying, and the other was rescued from the dead. And uh, when you look at this individual, it is a table of testimonies of what God has done in individuals' lives. Uh, you'll remember how that Mary and Martha had cried to the Lord to ask him uh, to heal their brother, to raise him uh, from the dead. Uh, they said this, Lord, if thou hast been here, he surely would wouldn't have died. And what you see is this, that they are sitting at a table of testimony about what God has done Amen. in their life. How about you, friend? Amen. I know in the busyness of our life and in the days uh, that we live in, how that we're always overwhelmed and overthinking everything that's happening around us. Hey, when's the last time you just sat around the table and looked at those uh, blessings of God that sit around you? How those things that only God could have done in your life? Amen. I think we're too busy in our life. Amen. I think we overlook what God has done for us. And in doing so, what we become is we get closer to that unthankful generation. Lord, I don't want to be like that. What we see is a home that has been drastically affected by a miracle that the Lord has performed. That's what you're seeing. That is the picture of Simon the leper's house here at Bethany. So we see the picture. Let's look at the presentation beginning in verse number 7. The presentation. Let's look at what was offered. We'll bounce back and forth from here in John chapter number 12. If you got an extra finger, uh, put your finger in John chapter number 12. It'll start in verse number 1. Uh, but in verse 7 of Matthew 26, he said this, There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. Now, in John chapter 12, he said this, uh, in verse 2, there they made him a supper and Martha served, uh, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Uh, then took Mary a pound of ointment of Spikener very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Uh, now listen, if you're looking at this, what you're going to say is this. Uh, John says that she anointed his feet and Matthew says that she anointed his head. Uh, but when you look at the account, what you see is this. Uh, that doesn't negate that she could have done both of them. 
And it's likely that she did exactly that. As a matter of fact, what you're finding is this, uh, that Mary is offering something that is very precious to her, uh, to the Lord himself. And so as you look at these things, what you're seeing is you're seeing an alabaster box uh, that is a container which contains spikener, according to uh, John chapter number 12. Uh, now the Bible tells us uh, that this offering was a very precious ointment uh, that she had brought to the Lord Jesus. Uh, now this is something uh, that is very costly according to the scriptures. And so when you look at these things, what you're seeing is this. She, not only has she brought something that's very precious, uh, but she's bought, uh, brought something uh, that costs a significant amount of money. Now, as Judas will show up here in a few moments in John chapter number 12, what you'll find is this. Uh, he would declare that this was worth 300 pence. I thought that thing was making noise again. It was. I'm glad I'm not losing my mind. All right. Uh, the Judas would declare uh, that this thing was worth 300 pence. And if a penny, according to the New Testament scriptures, uh, was about the value of a day's wage, uh, then what you're looking at is the, uh, the better part of a year's worth of wages uh, to purchase this, uh, this ointment of spikenard or this alabaster box, if you will, uh, that she might have these things. Needless to say... This gift was the, uh, that was given was the best that Mary had to offer. There is some significance to that. There's some significance to that. She offers, let me put it this way, nearly an entire year worth of wages in this anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, 300 pence doesn't sound like much. But when you start putting a yearly salary on that, may I remind you, these are not wealthy individuals. These are not the best of the best. No, those were the Pharisees and the kings and of those individuals. Those were the ones that were fairly dressed. No, what you're looking at is the ones following Jesus were often the meek and lowly. Amen. They were the fishermen. Those lower end. And may I say this? You say, well, I, that's not me. You shouldn't think so highly of yourself, amen? There is a danger and a detriment to, th to thinking too highly of ourselves. Now, the, uh, the value of the product declares the value of the, uh, of the Lord in Mary's eyes. May I say this? Uh, this gift was often used in anointing bodies after their death, uh, and what it was used for is to help with the decaying smell uh, so that it wouldn't overwhelm those individuals. And, and to be honest with you, uh, that brings up an interesting thought in my mind uh, concerning why she didn't use it on her brother who was dead uh, in just the previous chapter of John, chapter number 11. I wonder if she... She hadn't already trusted that the Lord uh, was able to raise him back from the dead and that she was saving this uh, for a better time uh, such as the present moment that we are looking at in Matthew chapter number 26. And so we saw uh, what was offered. It was an alabaster box. Now, as you think of an alabaster box, it is an, a, an intriguing object. It is a, 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 a somewhat of a, a stone or a... a, a uh, elements that have been uh, formed in the shape of a box and what you'll find with that box is this uh, that they would put something very costly in there John declares to us that it is spikenard and that it was very costly and so they would put that in there uh, but what you'll find with that is this they would then seal that, uh, uh, that alabaster box uh, to the point to where it would not open itself right. you say why is that? so you wouldn't lose the contents that were within it and we'll deal with this here in a moment. But in order to open this, it had to be broken. It had to be broken. Mary took the alabaster box with a spike and, and, and anointed. And so let's look, we saw what was offered. Let's look at what we observe. Mary took, takes the alabaster box with the spike and she anoints the head and feet uh, of Jesus while he sat uh, at this table, at the food, at, at this meal. And, and listen here, uh, there is a necessary act that must occur. And we've already said this. Uh, in order for the contents of the alabaster box to be used, and that fact is this, uh, that that box must be broken. In 
order for the valued gift that is within it, uh, that is very costly, in order for that to be used, uh, then that box must be broken. And what you'll find is that this vessel, in order to do that which Mary desires with this vessel, uh, she must break it in order to anoint the Lord uh, to do the work that she is before him to do. And listen, I'll get into some, uh, a great picture here in a moment. But let me, ask, let me state this. There's a certain aspect in this Christian life that is not desired. And that is the breaking of an individual. We've already said this. Nobody enjoys suffering. But may I say this? God uses suffering to help to mold his child. It's not pleasant. I've yet to meet the individual that was pleased with suffering. But I will say this, coming on, out on the other side of it, I've often seen how God's hand have, has worked in the midst of that. And what you are seeing is that she is going to break this alabaster box in order for this process to take effect. This is the process we are taught. It's in this process we are taught to lean on the Lord and not ourselves. It is often this process, unfortunately, that people count it too great a cost to serve the Lord. And what they do is they turn back to their carnality because being broken is too high a cost for some individuals. May I say this, your Savior was broken for you. Amen. Amen. I know we don't enjoy suffering. We don't enjoy those times. But what you'll find is, is this, God uses those times. May I say this, you'll never see the Lord use you in a mighty way until you are lowered in your own sight. And what you'll find is this, that the Lord is able to raise you up at the end of that process. The examples are endless. The examples in your Bible are endless of individuals that were broken. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, David, Solomon in the early days of his life. How about Simon Peter? Jesus comes to Simon Peter and he said this, Lovest thou me more than these? And he said it three times. Probably because he denied him three times. But let me move on and say this. Even John the Beloved learned some lessons from suffering. This isn't a pleasant process, but what you'll find is that it's worth it in the end. What you see in this account of Mary taking this alabaster box and this very precious ointment and pouring it on his head as he sat at me is her anointing that is indicated by the Lord uh, concerning her burial. What you are seeing uh, that is being put on display in this scene is this, that Mary is offering her worship to the Lord. Right. May I remind you, worship requires humility. It requires a lowering of self. So we see what was offered. We see what we observed. Let's look at a witness that overwhelmed. John declares that Mary anointed the feet of Jesus with the ointment. Now it's intriguing to me and likely the case according to uh, those days that as they sat around the table, it's likely that they were sitting on the ground themselves as there weren't a lot of chairs in those days. And you know, may I remind you, uh, these are not the wealthy individuals of those days. Now, there were wealthy individuals. Uh, as a matter of fact, you'll find one of them uh, that makes his way into a place called hell in the Gospel of Luke, a rich, uh, a rich man. And there were wealthy individuals in those days, uh, but oftentimes outside of a couple individuals, uh, Jesus didn't make his way into their homes. And so as you look at this account, it's likely uh, that they are sitting on the ground, which makes uh, the idea even more significant uh, that Mary was able uh, uh, to get down to the feet of Jesus, which means this, uh, that she literally had to lower herself uh, as far as she could uh, to get this task done. 
What you see is this, uh, that Mary is consistently found around the feet of Jesus. And may I say this, for those of you, uh, you young preachers that are looking for a message or an outline, uh, you'll find that in all the times that Mary is found, uh, you'll find that she is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Uh, you'll find her falling at the feet of Jesus. And then here again in Matthew 26 and John 12, uh, you'll find her anointing the feet of Jesus. What you'll find is, is this, uh, that these are all three places of submission. Uh, she has submitted herself to the Lord. And you'll remember how that uh, when she sat at the feet of Jesus learning, uh, that Jesus said this about her, uh, that she had done this good part. Uh, meaning this, it was a good place for her to be. And may I say this, uh, for you in your life, the best decision you can make is to submit yourself to the Lord. Lower yourself at His feet. Get to the place uh, to where you don't think so much of yourself, you lower yourself at his feet so that he might use you to do his work. Amen. It is a necessity. If you're going to do the work of God, you cannot be full of pride. Amen. May I say this, too often we are full of ourselves. And it shows out. Amen. Amen. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Amen. It is the problem with mankind. Now, I'll be honest with you. I don't know why we think so much of ourselves because there's really nothing good about ourselves. Outside of what the Lord's done, there's nothing good about us. Not only do we see Mary submitting herself to the Lord, but we see her taking her hair and wiping the feet of Jesus. Ladies, I would say your hair is significant. Would I be wrong in that statement? No. Your hair means something to you. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians tells us that long hair is a glory to the woman. Amen. It is her glory. And so as you look at these things, what you're finding is that on the surface you are seeing a humbling act in her lowering herself to wipe his feet with her hair. But may I say this, uh, you also see this, uh, that in doing so what she is doing is she is taking her glory and glorifying the Lord with it. She was ready to sacrifice what was precious to her for an individual that was more precious to her. Let me ask you this, and I'm not going to linger here for a long time, but let me ask you this. What's your glory worth to you? You say you're preaching to the ladies? No, I'm preaching to you men as well. What's your glory worth to you? Are you willing to sacrifice that which means the world to you for your Lord and Savior. What cost are you willing to pay? She's already given. Listen, when she gave a year's wages, many would have said, that's a good cost. You paid a significant amount. She paid more than anybody else in that room. Was it enough? Not in her eyes. She then takes that 300 pence, that year's worth of wages, she takes that gift and she begins to offer it to the Lord as she anoints his head and then uh, on the ground she begins to wipe his feet uh, with her hair uh, using that which uh, she had given to the Lord. Uh, may I say this? The greatest thing we can do uh, with that which we would claim to be our own glory is to take that and offer it on the altar of service to the Lord himself. Uh, meaning this, you say, how do you do that? What you do is you take everything that you think is real important and you lay that down on the altar and you say, God, this is yours. Uh, what is my life? My life is to be used uh, by you. Whatever I have, it is yours. Whatever I am, it is yours. And so you see, as Mary is the example, she is an example of an individual uh, who has wholly given herself uh, for the cause of Christ to give him worship. And may I say this, many would have found an excuse to have not done what she did. But at the end of the day, the Lord was pleased with her proper worship. 
May I remind you, worship is a humbling thing. It's not you waving your hands. It's not you shouting at the top of your lungs. Worship in the Bible is you falling on your face to give glory to a God that is worthy of your praise. So let's look at number three, what purpose? What purpose? We'll dive into the depths, the depths of the message. What purpose? In verses 8 through 12 of Matthew 26, let's look at the disciples' statement in verse number 8. The disciples' statement in verse number 8. Verse 8, he said this, But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? Indignation is defined by Webster as anger or extreme anger. It is mingled with contempt, disgust, or abhorrence. And now may I say this, uh, when you look at these things, uh, Mary had done that which was honorable according to what the Lord is going to say uh, in the later portions of this text. Uh, but it is intriguing to me uh, that those who have seen the Lord behind lifted up, uh, they, uh, three of them at least, have seen him on the Mount of Transfiguration. They know the Lord and who he is. And listen, may I say this, uh, it's disturbing to me that those who had been the closest to him during his, uh, his earthly ministry are the individuals that are saying, uh, why would you offer such a sacrifice to the Lord himself? Amen. That's disturbing, amen? Sure. Not only is it disturbing, but the manner in which they went about it is disturbing. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, to what purpose is this, what's that word? Waste. To what purpose is this waste? Can I tell you, anything done for God is never a waste. Amen. 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 Anything done for God is never a waste. But I believe we are looking at something else here. In John chapter number 12, there is an intriguing individual that stirs up this account that we are looking at. As a matter of fact, John tells us that it is Judas uh, Iscariot who is the first individual to speak up against what was being done. And listen, John tells us that he did so on a false pretense, uh, stating this, uh, that it was not because uh, Judas cared about the poor that he said this. Uh, as a matter of fact, John said this. He said this, this, he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had, a, had the bag and bare what was put therein. And so as you look at Judas, what you're finding is this. Judas is a very carnal individual. And so it is no, uh, uh, it is no question or no uh, concept uh, in that uh, Judas has questioned that which has been done for the Lord. As a matter of fact, uh, in these very chapters, you'll find uh, that in J uh, Matthew 26, Judas is going to agree to betray Jesus and he is going to go to the, uh, to the Pharisees and work out a deal uh, to betray him. And so uh, when you're looking at Judas. Judas is an individual. He is a traitor according to the scriptures and as you look at this individual uh, you'll see that there is a spirit about him. Uh, not that he cared about anybody else. You'll find that Judas cared about himself and in his actions, his actions spoke that. Uh, but there is an intriguing event that happens. Not only does Judas speak up and say these things, but the other disciples fall in right behind him. Can I tell you, it's no surprise that Judas would act this way. Amen. The troubling part is that the other disciples would follow him and would agree with the traitor. That's the troubling part. May I say, it's always troubling when there is a critical spirit in a crowd. Amen. It's equally concerning how contagious that spirit is. That's why you ought to be careful who you hang out with, young people. That's why you ought to be careful who you hang out with, not so young people. Amen. You say, that's just a youth message. It ain't. Amen. Amen. You say, what's the difference between an adult and a youth? What I found is this. Adults are able to hide their emotions a little better. That's about it. Yep, you still got the same desires that the youth have. Amen. It's the same things that bother you. Yes, you say they're, they're not as bad as they once were, but what you'll find is that sin is no respecter of persons. 
It'll, it'll eat you up just like it'll eat every other young person up. And so as you look at these things, what you'll find that uh, the distinction is this uh, it doesn't care uh, who you are uh, as a matter of fact if you'll spend a great deal of time around a critical person uh, what you'll find is that you'll begin to be a critical individual yourself uh, and listen uh, it's clearly seen I don't know if you've ever been in a workplace and worked around an individual uh, that just seems like their life is miserable uh, that they, everything's going wrong they can't stand anything everything's the worst that it could be and it's intriguing how that that will begin uh, to creep onto you uh, you'll begin to look at the negative sides of everything and you'll begin to look at uh, how everything's not working right and it's not being run right and it's that person's fault and everybody else's fault instead of you just being content uh, with the things that you have and you'll find that uh, that critical spirit uh, will come off of one individual and will begin to contage or, or will become contagious and will begin to affect another individual. Right. Right. Amen. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. What you'll find, I don't know if you've ever done this. How many apples, how many bad apples does it take to ruin an entire basket full of apples? It takes one. And that's all it takes. And you'll find that that contamination will work its way through the other apples. By the way, it works the same for you and I. That's why you ought to be very careful who you hang out with. Amen. Amen. You say, well, I'm hanging out with Christian folk. May I say this? Some Christian folk ain't worth hanging out with. I'm going to meddle for a minute. Let me say this, young ladies. Just because that boy says he's saved doesn't mean he's the right one for you. You're right. Amen. You're right. Amen. I've seen a lot of saved individuals wasn't good for nothing. Sorry individuals what they were. They might be born again. They might be headed to heaven when they die, uh, but there'll be no use for the cause of Christ all the days of their life because of the decisions they make, the way they live their life, uh, how they have decided uh, that they may be born again, but they're not going to live a life for Jesus Christ. And so that is a sorry individual. And may I say this, I've seen it this way. Uh, what you'll find is this, uh, that often those men, uh, those young men, they'll come to church long enough to win your heart and to win your marriage, uh, but the moment you put that ring on your hand, uh, they're going to walk away from God, they're going to sit at the house, and you're going to spend the rest of your days coming to church by yourself. And you may take your kids to church uh, by yourself, uh, but that's going to be a testimony to your children uh, that church is not important. And so what you need to do is you need to find a young man uh, that falls in love with God. You ought to make sure he loves God more than he loves you. And what you'll find is, is this, uh, that that home has the opportunity to work uh, because it's not based on you and him. It's based on the Lord himself. Right. Amen. Amen. By the way, you young men, it's the same way for you. Don't you marry some uh, useless woman. Amen. 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 Let me say it to you young men, you young preachers. The greatest detriment to your life will be a woman that does not love God. That'll take you straight out the ministry. Yes, sir. Amen. Make your life no use for the cause of Christ. Amen. Take a testimony of a good young man. And listen, I've seen it time and time and time again. Uh, that's why I can say these things. Uh, I've seen it happen. Uh, I've seen individuals uh, fall in love with a woman and, and that woman not be in love with God, but she comes to church just enough to appease uh, his desires. And what you find is, is this, uh, that she may show up to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, uh, but her heart's a million miles away from it. And so as she's trying to get away from it, uh, she's dragging that young boy with her away from God. God that is the problem with this spirit that you find in Judas it's contagious and by the way it works in our lives just the same can I tell you this situation had nothing to do with the poor this situation is supposed to be about the Lord and his anointing before his death and the disciples have completely missed the picture of what should have been a grand thing. They completely missed it. They dealt with this situation in a carnal manner. And what you're finding is this. It's going to have an effect on how this is received. 
the disciples' statement. Let's look at a demeaning stand in verse number 9 of Matthew 26. He said this, For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Now, in John chapter 12 and verse number 5, uh, Judas said this, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now, John would follow that statement up with this one in verse 6. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare uh, what was put therein. And so what you find of Judas is this. He didn't care about the poor. He was the individual that carried the money uh, of the disciples. And what John says is this, uh, that he was a thief and the only concern he had was that he might gain uh, th those funds, that 300 pence, and not that he could give it to the poor, uh, but that he might take it for himself. And so what you see in the character of Judas is, is this. When worship was to be given to the Lord, Judas desired that for himself. It is a troubling place to be in. And may I say this? When this life becomes more about you than it does the Lord, you're in for a train wreck. It'll always end up that way. This ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. May I say this? Although their statement may have been unintentional, except for what Judas had to say, what they said was is this taking this ointment and giving it to the poor is more important than Jesus Christ. That, in effect, is what they said. Let me remind you, the closest friends he had in his ministry on earth just said, that alabaster box and that ointment should have been sold because it's more important than you are. That is more important, more important than you being worshipped at this time, may I say, this, that is a dangerous place to live. We see the disciples' statement, a demeaning stand. Let's look at a declared sentiment in verses 10 through 12. A declared sentiment. And the Lord offers this, this rebuke to those individuals. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? Notice this. For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you. But me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. The initial statement that the Lord gives declares his approval of what Mary had done for him. And may I say this, if the Lord approves of what you are doing, then it doesn't matter who disapproves of it. Amen. If the Lord is for what you are doing, uh, then it doesn't matter who stands against that. Now, may I say this, because uh, there will be an individual in here and says this, uh, well, I feel like this is right. Uh, may I say this, uh, you ought to try your feeling by the scriptures. Amen. Uh, just, to, just to remove that doubt that uh, pe because people are going to go by their feelings. I know how man works. That's how uh, men, uh, uh, men figure it out. Uh, you say, what do you want for lunch? And you check your feelings. Or you ask your wife. Amen. And then you check your feelings. <laughs> uh, there's a chance she ain't giving you an answer. Amen. Amen. But what you find is, is this. You can't trust your feelings. And so you need to try what you're doing by the scriptures. If it lines up with what this book says, then it don't matter who's against you. It don't matter what anybody else has to say. Amen. If I've got God's approval, I don't need your approval, friend. Right. Amen. Amen. And so Mary gets the approval of God. And listen, uh, once again, you see that the Lord has mentioned his death. Now, may I say this? This is not the first time that the Lord has mentioned that he is going to die uh, uh, to his disciples. Remember, there's not a great deal of individuals in this home. Uh, we've got Simon the leper. Uh, we've got Lazarus, Mary, Martha, the 12 disciples. And so there are very few individuals that we know of that are in this place. And, and so Jesus is once again telling them uh, concerning his death. But what you'll find with the disciples is that they never really understood that Jesus was going to die. They never got it. They missed it every time. As a matter of fact, Simon Peter would say this. He, he would take the Lord off to the side and the Bible literally says that he began to rebuke the Lord for what he had said concerning his death. 
Now that's pretty brazen. That's pretty brazen. You're going to tell the Lord he's wrong and begin to rebuke him? Now Simon Peter is the individual I can see it clearly, clearly doing it. Amen. Because he, in his early days, thought a lot of himself and what he had to say. And oftentimes he spoke before he thought. Any of you men ever guilty of that? Well, Brother Tyler, how about the rest of you? Sorry, dogs. Y'all couldn't even say amen right there. Every one of us are guilty. Amen. You ain't in it by yourself. We're all guilty of it. Amen. Uh, but what you see is that Simon Peter would, uh, would act before he thought. They just never got it. I'd say it's likely. It's likely, maybe, listen, it's likely maybe that Mary, while sitting at the feet of Jesus, was actually listening to the words coming out of his mouth. You know, the disciples would have done well to have done that because they didn't get it. Amen. You know, following him around, doing all these great miracles. Jesus has told them numerous times that he's going to die, and they didn't get it. Maybe if they'd have listened, they'd have caught on to what Mary had likely caught on to as she begins to offer this sacrifice for the Lord. For verse 12 says this, For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. So let's look lastly at a preserved testimony, and we'll be finished this morning. Verse number 13, a preserved testimony. May I say this, what you're looking at is going to be remembered all for all eternity because of what Mary did on that day. Verse 13 said, Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. May I say this, that this is an all-encompassing testimony. Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world. And so what you are seeing is that uh, this event would be recognized across the world and surely has been uh, since the scriptures have made its way all the way across this planet concerning what this woman did at this one time in the final week of our Lord's ministry as he's leading up to the crucifixion how that she was willing to give of herself to worship the Lord. Not only do we see it's all encompassing, but let's look at his endorsement. There shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial for her. Can I tell you, I don't think you'll find a greater approval than the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he said was is this, they'll remember this forever. You say, how are they going to remember it? Because it's included in the canon of Scripture and it's settled for all eternity. And what she did on that day will never be forgotten. Can I tell you something else we'll never forget? You'll never forget what Judas did on that day. But you'll also not forget what those disciples that followed his leadership did on that day. I've said it like this, and I'll say it again. How many of you are glad your story is not included in the Bible? Amen. Amen. I'm glad he didn't put all my faults and failures in there, Brother Beckham. There would have been plenty of them for the all generations to see. But what you see is you had the opportunity of a woman that she gave what was precious to her to somebody who was more precious to her. Let me ask you this, and we'll be finished. I wonder what you're willing to give for him. Oftentimes, we draw lines in our lives. Lord, you can have this to this point. You can have my life except for and then fill in the blank. That's often how we live our lives. The Lord knows that one thing you're unwilling to give up. The Lord wants that one thing you're unwilling to give up. And may I say this, he's worthy of it. 
Let's have everybody stand this morning. Brother Connor, you got a song for us? Brother Beckham? It's Abby. May I remind you, she offered what was precious to her to someone who was more precious to her. His